Hello students, welcome to IAX by Heart. Welcome to the Prelims East Initiative, where we will discuss the most probable questions that might feature in your UPSC Prelims 2021. As you might know, UPSC has released their notification on 4th of March. So the last day to fill this application is 24th of March. So without any delay, do it as soon as possible. Do not wait for the last minute rush. So this time they have notified 712 vacancies and uh, 110 vacancies for Indian Forest Service. So I wish you all the best. Uh, put consistent efforts. You will surely clear this exam. Okay. So without any further delay, let's jump into the Prelims Heast series for today. Let's see the first question. The first question is from Polity. Here, which of the following laws programs are were formulated by successive governments in order to implement directives as under part four of the constitution? We know part four talks about DPSPs. So these are the general directions given by the constitution makers to the governments for, and the future governments. Okay, so the Wildlife Protection Act, and then we have Legal Services Authorities Act, 73rd and 74th Constitutional Amendment Acts. These are nothing but uh, local government acts, panchayats and municipality acts. And we also have Criminal Procedure Code. So they're asking which of the following laws or programs were formulated to implement DPSPs. So what you have to do is you have to see if you can associate any of these acts with any of the DPSPs. Okay, I'll give you 30 seconds time, uh, give your answers in the comment box. Okay, the answer to this question is all of the above. All the above laws uh, deals with one or the other DPSPs. Let's see how in the explanation part. So you can see that uh, Wildlife Protection Act was enacted to safeguard the wildlife. It was done in uh, 1972. So this is associated with Article 48A. So let's see what is Article 48A here. So protection and improvement of environment and safeguarding of forests and wildlife. This is dealt by Wildlife Protection Act. Okay. Then Legal Services Authorities Act. So to provide free and competent legal aid to the poor under Article 39A. So 39A states that equal justice and free legal aid, especially for the poor and weaker sections. That is done by LSA Act of uh, 1987. And then we have a, a three-tier Panchayat Raj system. So this has been introduced to translate Gandhiji's dream. It is one of the important Gandhian principle. Article 40. Article 40 talks about organization of village panchayats, uh, an important part of democratic decentralization. Okay. And the fourth one, uh, criminal procedure code. This is uh, probably the option where you might uh, get confused whether criminal procedure code deals with any of the DPSP. Yes, it does. It does have a role in Article 50. 50 states uh, the separation of judiciary from executive. So actually the criminal procedure code, what it does is it gives the executive the procedure that must be followed. That must be followed in criminal matters. So it uh, prevents the executive from uh, pronouncing judgments on their own or uh, giving punishments on their own. They cannot be the judge of their own. So that is why CRPC has an important role to play with respect to Article 50, the separation of judiciary from executive. So DPSP is an important aspect. I want all of you to memorize all the articles in under DPSP. So these things can also be used in your mains answers where you can quote uh, uh, any of the article to substantiate your point. Okay. So let's uh, move on to the next question. The next question is from economy about uh, different types of deficit, fiscal deficit, revenue deficit, effective revenue deficit and primary deficit. I have asked the basic definitions here. I want you to answer this question in the comment box below. I'll give you 30 seconds. Okay, the answer to this question is boy. 
we have uh, seen what fiscal deficit is in our session 9 so you might have uh, easily deduced that it is the difference between total receipts excluding borrowing and total expenditure and uh, b uh, is for revenue deficit difference between day to day expenditure and receipts of the government that is revenue expenditure revenue deficit and uh, effective revenue deficit this is nothing but uh, the uh, excluding the grants given by the center to states for creation of capital assets basically the grants given to states will result in a, a creation of productive assets the government has uh, said that uh, this should not be calculated in uh, revenue deficit that's why they created this effective revenue deficit term where only the effective deficit is calculated primary deficit it indicates the borrowing requirements of the government excluding interest so it is primarily the deficit uh, the fiscal deficit minus all the interest payments okay so that is what a uh, primary deficit is so the answer to this question is b uh, you have to be really thorough with the definitions of all kinds of deficits in economy section because uh, time and again the uh, upsc has uh, asked these questions okay so go through the different definitions once from prelims perspective okay so first of all let's see why this question was asked the reason is because a fiscal deficit uh, news related to fiscal deficit often features in newspapers so you have to know about the different kinds of deficit even in our economic survey the budget we have always uh, talking about fiscal deficit fiscal consolidation and uh, fiscal discipline etc so i want you to know about the different targets kept under the different deficits okay let's move on to the next question on uh, international relations which of the following statements are not correct regarding the international criminal court okay so international criminal court it is the primary judicial branch of the united nations it has the jurisdiction to prosecute individuals for the international crimes of genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes that statement india became the first country ever to leave the icc i want you to give your answers in the comment section below and uh, remember they have asked the not correct options here do not give uh, the correct options okay the answer to this question is 1 and 3 only answer c both these statements are wrong because uh, the primary judicial branch of united nations is icj not uh, icc icj is international court of justice okay and uh, india became the first country ever to leave the icc this is also wrong india was never a signatory india is a non signatory to icc so third statement is also wrong only the second statement is right let's see more about this in the coming slide international criminal court it is an intergovernmental organization and an international tribunal in hague netherlands icj is also in hague netherlands okay and uh, icc is also here and uh, like we said does a jurisdiction to prosecute individuals for international crimes of genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes recently sri lanka was being tried for war crimes in northeastern part of sri lanka so that's why the uh, icc was in news and uh, icc began functioning on 1st july 2002 under the rome statute so you also have to remember rome statute always refers to icc and uh, the states which become party to rome statute become member of icc and uh, india is a non state party and non signatory not only india usa is also not a party to icc and uh, burundi is the first nation to leave the icc not india and uh, the reason is it unfairly targets africans that was the accusation brought by burundi against icc and uh, not only we that south africa and gambia also announced their withdrawal from icc so you can see how it is uh, losing its relevance in the international arena okay let's move on to the next question this is on reports and indices so we are talking about uh, the global risks report 
this is an annual study published by who so give your answers in the comment section the answer to this question is option a world economic forum so the world economic forum releases global risks report okay so you have to un, uh, read about different reports released by different organizations this is a uh, frequently asked question in upsc so i'll give you a clue so this wef world economic forum if you look at it, it uh, you can uh, remember it as wife okay like uh, wef so wif so wives are risk okay bear with me for the misogyny but uh, just for the sake of remembering it i'm uh, telling you this so remember wives are risks okay so wef releases global risks report okay so the answer to this question is a we'll see more about it in the coming slide so global risks report is an annual study published by world economic forum ahead of its annual meeting in davos okay and uh, wef has released the global risks report according to it uh, the top risks by likelihood and top risks by impact had been released and uh, the report findings are based on the global risk perception survey this survey was taken by all the member countries different communities different uh, academia in different countries so here the top risk by impact is identified as infectious disease especially in the corona era in the pandemic era infectious disease has been ranked as number 1 in uh, 2020 it was listed at 10th place from uh, place number 10 it uh, became it came to number 1 okay infectious diseases but uh, if you see most of the diseases most of the risks in the top 10 are associated with climate change okay the report also identifies climate change as one of the existential threat to humanity okay despite the pandemic you can see here the focus of the global risks report it is to highlight the risks and consequences of widening inequalities and increasing social fragmentation due to the covid pandemic that is being uh, the prime focus of this report this year and uh, the impact of covid 19 how it uh, how the years of progress on reducing poverty and inequality is being threatened by the pandemic okay the climate concerns despite the impact of pandemic climate related matters that dominated this year's risk list so climate threats are an existential threat to humanity that is noted by this report as well and the widening digital gaps for example digitalization which is accelerated by the pandemic is widening the digital gap between the individuals across countries you see we we have to suddenly shift to e learning very quickly it was accelerated by this pandemic like anything so we also have to note whether this e learning or e tools uh, they were affordable for everybody every section of the population because the poor really suffered and uh, this might uh, bring about an academic gap between the rich and the poor okay because uh, the poor people are really uh, they can't afford the tools like uh, the mobile phones the smartphones the zoom calls etc so how this pandemic is accelerating an academic gap as well that is being talked about in this report there were also intensifying pressures on businesses because uh, they uh, the businesses are uh, influenced by inward looking national agendas like uh, vaccine nationalism those and all are uh, putting the interests of the nations first and uh, then greater market concentration popular scrutiny and volatility uh, these are increasing the pressures on global businesses and global value chains okay so this is the summary of the report and uh, let's uh, move on to the next question this question is about uh, himalayan cerro and uh, they are found in eastern central and western himalayas but not in the trans himalayan region okay this statement is highly specific so just uh, keep it in doubt okay let's see the second statement it is found at altitudes between 200 and 400 meter above sea level okay let's uh, move on to the third statement 
Recently, a Himalayan cerro has been sited for the first time in the Himalayan cold desert region. Okay, if you see uh, the first and third statement talks about Himalayas, Himalayas, and uh, it is also being stated here that it has been sited for the first time in Himalayan cold desert region. So we have to look for consistency in the statements. Okay. If you see that the second statement says the altitude is between 200 to 400 meter above sea level, that kind of altitude relates to plains. Only plains are above 200 meters sea level. Okay, so we are talking about Himalayas here. So this kind of altitude would never be possible. So you remove option number two. So options uh, C and three are uh, C and B are eliminated, and uh, we have only one and one and three. And uh, between uh, option uh, one and three, you can say that uh, you can see that the third statement says it is being cited for the first time in the Himalayan cold desert region. Then, in no way it could be found in Trans Himalayan region. So first statement should also be true. So the answer to this question is one and three only. So this is how you can deduce the answer from the questions itself. You don't have to anything. Uh, you ha don't have to know anything about Himalayan cerro. You can just look for consistency and arrive at the right option. Okay. Uh, even though you can, uh, if you don't know whether a statement one or three is correct, you can eliminate options uh, C and D just by looking at statement two. Okay. And then you will have a 50, 50 percent chance. Good amount of chance you can take. So let's uh, move on to the explanation part. So let's see uh, Himalayan cerro. It is a medium sized mammal with a large head, thick neck, short limbs, long mule like ears, and a coat of dark hair. They say Himalayan cerro resembles a cross between a goat, a donkey, a cow, and a pig. You can see here, this is the Himalayan cerro. It looks like a cross between goat, cow, and a pig, a pig because of the hair, hair color. And uh, it looks, uh, it has a cow's or donkey's body and a goat's face. And uh, it is found at altitudes between 2000 and 4000 meters. In question, it was given 200 to 400. So that is wrong. And it is restricted to the Himalayan region. Uh, the statements one and two are correct. They are uh, found in uh, Western Himalayas, uh, Middle Himalayas, and the Eastern Himalayas, but not in the Trans Himalayan region. Trans Himalayan region is beyond this. Okay, The Karamporum ranges, the Ladakh ranges. Uh, Zanskar ranges, those are Trans Himalaya. So it is not found there. It is found only in these areas. Also, note they are, uh, they are in vulnerable status and uh, they are notified under Appendix 1 of Sites and Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act. This means that highest protection is given to these animals under Indian laws. Okay. So let's see why this question was asked. This question was asked because it was recently in news. And uh, an unusual sighting of uh, Cerro was reported in Spiti for the first time in the Himalayan cold desert region. Okay. And also it was spotted in Assam. Okay. It was also spotted in Assam. If you see, it is it, it its habitat avoids Assam. Okay. But uh, recently it was seen Assam as well. This was mentioned twice in the last two months. That's why this species is important from UPSC perspective. Let's move on to the next question. So this question is uh, from Science and Tech. So which of the following is correctly matched? A sunspot is a dark patch on the surface of the sun. Solar flares, they are magnetic storms with gaseous surface eruption. Solar prominence, it is an arc of gas that erupts from the surface of the sun. So you have to see which of the following is correctly matched. I'll give you 30 seconds to answer this question. So the answer to this question is option D. All of these are correctly matched. Okay. Let's see the explanation. These are uh, nothing but different solar phenomenons, sunspot. So here we have a sunspot. So sunspot is a dark patch on the surface of the sun. Okay. They are about 500 to 
1500 degree celsius cooler than the surrounding chromosphere okay so these are sun spots they are dark spots on the surface of the sun in chromosphere since they are very dark they will obstruct the sun's heat so they will be cooler than the surrounding chromosphere okay then uh, we have solar flares the solar flares are uh, mentioned here you can see how uh, they are erupting there is a gaseous surface eruption uh, with respect to solar flares they are magnetic storms as well anil tsunami people will tell that is nothing but the solar flares okay and we also have a solar prominence an arc of gas that erupts from the surface of the sun they spew enormous amounts of solar material into the space so a solar prominence it is an advanced form of solar flares so they form a clear arc like this okay they have the potential to disturb satellites and electric grids in earth okay because they travel so many miles into the space okay this is solar prominence okay as we are here let's also see the different uh, layers of the sun photosphere chromosphere and corona and uh, the solar atmosphere consists of photosphere chromosphere and corona corona is nothing is not uh, the covid 19 but uh, this is the solar corona which is a, a wind of outflow of gas from the corona if you see in the previous slide you can see this uh, a bright light emanating from the sun this is called as corona okay let's see one by one photosphere is the bright outer layer of the sun okay that emits most of the radiation so if you see sun will be like this and uh, this outer layer is the photosphere just above that we will have chromosphere and uh, corona is nothing but a, an atmosphere of plasma this is corona okay that is uh, the corona will usually be uh, the temperatures in corona will be much higher than the chromosphere okay and uh, just above the photosphere is the chromosphere a relatively thin layer of burning gases and it uh, chromosphere will be a bit cooler compared to photosphere okay whereas photosphere is an extremely uneven surface and it is the brightest outer layer of the sun that emits most of the radiation and uh, corona is the distinctive atmosphere of plasma plasma is nothing but ionized gas that surrounds the sun and uh, sun's corona is visible during the total solar eclipse i mean after the eclipse after the eclipse is done you might see only the corona for some time you can see the corona clearly okay isro is launching a mission called aditya aditya l1 to study the solar atmosphere and solar phenomena that's why this topic is important for your prelims 2021 okay let's move on to the next question uh, with respect to 18th century bengal okay the term takavi refers to takavi refers to i'll give you 30 seconds to answer this question is from medieval india recently upsc is asking these uh, definition type of questions in ancient and medieval india okay you have to know what different terms stands for and who introduced that okay so the answer to this question is option d loans given to poor cultivators okay let's see what this is so murshid kuli khan he was the nabab nabab of bengal so he granted agricultural loans known as takavis to the poor cultivators to relieve their distress okay and also to enable them to pay land revenue in time so this is given as loans in those times especially in the 16th century bengal and this was to induce the peasants to plow as much land as possible and to sow superior quality crops that was the aim behind this move and uh, this uh, the takavis were popular during the mughal era it uh, gained prominence during akbar's rule okay Mushid Kuli Khan he recruited revenue farmers local zamindars and merchant bankers to cooperate in the task these people will go and provide loans directly to the peasants to help them uh, increase their well, increase the quality of uh, crops and uh, also to submit land revenue to the state okay 
So remember this term. This word is even in use today in Bengal region. Takadi loans are given to the local farmers. Okay. Let's move on to the next question. This question is about uh, Saint uh, Ravi uh, Guru Ravi Das, and uh, the first statement says he was a mystic poet, saint of the Sufi movement. Second statement, he was a contemporary of Guru Nanak. And third statement, okay, the numbers are wrong. This is the second statement, and this is the third statement. His devotional verses are included in both Sikh scriptures and Hindu texts. I'll give you thirty seconds time to answer this question. So the answer to this question is two and three only. Okay, because uh, Saint Guru Ravi Das is not associated with Sufi movement; he is associated with Bhakti movement in Hinduism. He is a prominent secular poet of that time, and uh, he is a poet saint of the Bhakti movement during the 15th century. And he was also the founder of Ravi Dasya religion. So. he is venerated as a guru in the region of uttar pradesh rajasthan maharashtra madhya pradesh and mainly punjab and haryana so that is why he his verses were included in sikh scriptures because uh, his in area of influence is mainly punjab and haryana it is included in the guru granth sahib and uh, also the life details are uncertain and contested scholars believe he was born in 1450 chamar caste so this uh, this uh, he is believed to have lived from the middle of the 15th century to the middle of the 16th century okay this is more or less the uh, time period of baba guru nanak so it can be said that he is a contemporary of baba guru nanak so that's why our second statement was right and he was a poet saint social reformer and a spiritual figure and uh, his text are also included in hinduism in the panchvani text of dadupanti tradition okay there were numerous poems of ravi das which were included and uh, he taught the removal of social divisions of caste and gender he talked about unity in pursuit of personal spiritual freedoms okay so uh, i have asked this question because ravi das birth anniversary was uh, celebrated on 27th of february okay both the uh, vice president and uh, prime minister paid tributes and they also put out uh, wishes on twitter so that's why this personality is important for your main uh, prelims okay let's uh, move on to the next question which statement is true with reference to the recently launched pm bani scheme okay give your answers in the comment section the answer to this question is option b so this is to elevate the wireless internet connectivity in the country so pm bani is nothing but pm wifi access network interface that is the full form of pm bani it is associated with the establishment of public wifi networks across the country okay this is done by the department of telecommunications and uh, pm bani is an attempt by the government to elevate wireless internet connectivity in the country so this would enable small shopkeepers to provide wifi service so the idea is that every small shops the kirana shops tea shops etc these shops can set up local wifi hotspots okay and uh, they can act as pdos that is a uh, pdos public data offices do you remember in those days we had a uh, pcos okay if you if you want to call somebody not everybody had a uh, mobile phones in those times you have no other option but to uh, go to pcos and make a local call to whoever you wanted to speak to so that is the same idea being replicated here and this time in the form of pdos public data offices 
if you want to use internet you can just come to the shop uh, sit there and use the local wifi okay that is the idea and uh, this is expected to boost incomes as well as provide internet connectivity especially to the youth and the poor people who are uh, who are not reaping the benefits of the internet connection the seamless internet connectivity okay let's uh, see more about uh, the wani infrastructure the government will develop an app to register users and discover the bani compliant wifi hotspots so if you see we have a public data office at the bottom so these are the kirana shops tea shops etc this will establish maintain and operate wifi access points and they will deliver the broadband services to subscribers okay and uh, the pdoa they are aggregators they are usually the isps internet service providers who are ready to provide this local hot, hotspots to the tea shops so they will perform the functions relating to authorization and accounting okay and uh, then we have app providers so we saw that uh, the app providers will help users to discover the wani compliant wifi hotspots in the nearby area so this will help them to register on the network and make payments okay and uh, we also have a central registry at the top so this is maintained by the center for the development of telematics for details of app providers pdoas and pdos so all these information will be collected under a central registry okay so here no license fee will be charged for providing broadband internet services so no license fee for the tea shops they can provide it for free but uh, the public who are using this hotspots they can use it only after an e kyc authentication okay the customers wanting to access network has to complete an e kyc authentication and uh, the public hotspots are expected to encourage the internet penetration across the country okay that's all we have about pm money let's see why this question was asked that's because this was passed recently and the cabinet has approved setting up of public wifi hotspots and uh, it is also expected to connect more people to the internet and uh, this public low wifi low is a low cost option to reach unserved citizens and help grow the economy also remember facebook and uh, google had also tried to provide these local hotspots but they had to ultimately close ultimately close because ultimately close because it was not profitable for them okay because uh, the low internet costs provided by jio airtel etc it is a, a significant competition for this kind of initiatives we also have to this will also be a hindrance to the success of pm money but uh, this is a step in the right direction let's see the how the government will face this challenge the low cost internet challenge okay let's move on to the next question the final question for today on uh, fast tag so which of the following statements about fast tag is not true fast tag cards have a limited validity of 1 year and it uses rfid technology and fast tag had been made compulsory at all toll plazas from february 15 to 2021 it is operated by national highways authority of india and uh, they have asked about the not true option okay give your answers in the comment box below the answer to this question is option a fast tag cards have a limited validity of one year that statement is false let's see more about this so you know fast tag it is an electronic toll collection system operated by national highways authority of india and it employs rfid technology so uh, the fast tag is affixed on the windscreen of the vehicle and it enables drive through toll plazas without stopping for transactions we all know how uh, time consuming the toll traffic can be because if you pay one by one it takes a lot of time so that is why they have uh, come up with this idea and uh, this can be purchased from official tag issuers or participating banks okay and uh, top ups can be done as per requirement and recently they have also announced up to 75% cashback to popularize fast tags okay 
and uh, as per nai fast tag has un- unlimited validity and here it was given limited validity up to 1 year what you have to know is that fast tag have has unlimited validity okay the ministry of road transport and highways has issued orders making it compulsory from february 15 of 2021 okay in all toll plazas there is no exception here from 15th of february it is compulsory across the country okay and uh, i asked this question because it was in news very recently and uh, you have to know the basic features of fast tag okay so briefly let's see what all we covered in this session the first question was about dpsp different acts passed under dpsp and how uh, different acts corresponded to different articles under part 4 of the constitution we also saw about different types of deficits and uh, we saw about the international criminal court and how india is not a party to it and uh, the losing relevance of icc in africa we also saw about the global risk report by wef infectious diseases moved to the number one spot okay in the pandemic era we also saw about himalayan serop it was recently spotted in assam and himalayan a uh, cold national park a uh, cold desert park sorry and uh, we also saw about the different solar phenomenon uh, sun spots solar flares and uh, solar prominence we also saw, uh, saw about takabi loans of in bengal it was popular during the mughal regime we also saw about uh, saint ravi das his birth anniversary and uh, how he is a contemporary of uh, baba guru nanak he is a secular poet and uh, he was the founder of ravi dasia religion and then uh, we saw about uh, pm vani wifi access network interface and how uh, it could improve the internet connectivity and reduce the digital divide between different sections of the population and uh, finally we saw about fast tag and the unlimited validity that is the point to note here unlimited validity it is implemented by national highways authority of india okay that's all that's all the 10 questions that we saw today i want you to revise it once again and uh, if you have any questions please uh, type it in the comment box below and i will happily clear every one of them okay If you don't have any questions, we'll wrap up the session. Okay, thank you, thank you for listening to this session. Stay tuned for upcoming sessions. I will see you in another video. Thank you.